Another day, another opportunity. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're back with another season preview podcast. Today we're going to be looking at the Minnesota Timberwolves, a team that obviously has undergone some significant changes in the offseason and to discuss all those changes and everything about the Minnesota Timberwolves, I am joined by the host of the Locked On Wolves podcast and that is Colton Molesky. Colton, how are you? I'm doing great. Excited to be talking basketball and really excited that the season is just right around the corner. Yeah, we're like uh, six weeks away here from the start of the, or maybe seven weeks, but, but close enough to six weeks to the start of the NBA season. And uh, I guess for once in about what must feel like forever, that there's a, a it's an exciting time to be a Minnesota Timberwolf fan, to be um, a team or to have a team that you feel good at, that you're going to be in the playoffs for the first time in, you know, multiple multiple years and you're going to have you know, legitimate stars on your team so it's a pretty exciting time for you covering the team and for all minnesota fans absolutely and you can kind of see a little bit of a path being etched out for the wolves too with the clippers losing chris paul and utah obviously losing gordon hayward so some of those teams that were kind of in the top tier of the west are losing players as the timberwolves are building their roster around town so it's it's really looking up for the Timberwolves as a whole. Now, on these uh, season preview podcasts, I start by looking at the, the players the team has added. I just finished the season the season preview for the Suns, and the players that they added were Mike James. The Minnesota Timberwolves edition are a little bit more exciting than uh, adding Mike James to the roster. <laughs> a little bit. A little, a little bit different. They've turned over a significant chunk of the roster. By the way, the roster is still not full. There are plenty of open roster spots. They're, I think they've only got 13 guys signed plus uh, one two-way guy and some of the back end of the roster is Mellow Trimble and Marcus George Hunt. So they've li- probably only got 10 actual NBA players on their roster at the moment. So there are you know, spots open for other guys to sign, but we're only going to talk about the guys who actually signed at this point. And let's start with the biggest name, one of the biggest names uh, to move teams this offseason, and that is Jimmy Butler. We've talked about that Jimmy Butler trade ad nauseum about the uh, huge deal that the, the Wolves got the great, uh, you know, the great deal, the, I guess, few assets that they had to give up, you know, getting back pick 16 as well. But Butler comes over, we know that. He slots straight into a starting wing position next to Andrew Wiggins. What does it mean you know, for this team or for the other players already on this team with Butler coming across, a player who was the, the man in Chicago last year, even though he didn't have the highest usage rate, that went to Dwayne Wade, but he's going to come in, he's going to take his shot. So where do these... Where do these shots come from? Who is sacrificing to get Butler to uh, to be at a similar level that he was in Chicago? Or does Butler is Butler the one that takes the step back to allow Wiggins and Towns to develop? I don't think Butler takes a step back. I think this is one of those perfect scenarios that we don't see a ton of in sports because not only is Butler coming in, Zach Levine is leaving obviously everybody knows that he was part of the package being set to the Chicago Bulls and he took a lot of shots so there's not going to be a ton of shots lost for Wiggins or Towns and I think if there are a couple shots that go to Butler it's probably from Wiggins but for the most part I think you see him slide pretty nicely into this offense and then on the defensive side the net rating for the Wolves per 100 possessions they were given up about 110 uh, 110.9 points every 100 possessions, so he definitely helps with that. So he's going to slide into the offense. I don't think he's going to take away shots, and he's going to really improve on their defensive side of things. He's going to be really good in isolation defense. He's going to be able to stick to the number one guy on the opposing team, and he's going to help the guys around him. I think Wiggins is also going to improve as a defender because he's guarding the second or the third guy on the opposite team as opposed to taking that number one guy. So his defense is going to be able to develop when he's not covering the best guy on the opposing team. I think um, it's probably best maybe if, if we speak about Butler in in terms of the shots with the addition of Jeff Teague as well because yeah, having Jeff Teague come across, it's a little bit different in terms of offensive responsibility than what Ricky Rubio had there last season. So 
is Teague the guy then that has to, to suffer from what he did uh, back in Indiana in terms of shots taken? Because the addition of Butler and Teague took significantly more shots than the combination of Levine and Rubio last season. So is it Teague the one who is the biggest loser? Or is everyone, you know, maybe lose a, a shot or two here or there? Or is it just you know, mainly Teague taking this secondary facilitating role? I think Teague will take more of that secondary facilitating role. But I also think the beauty of the team is that now they have a bunch of different packages, right, to throw out against teams. So we saw last year the teams that were really successful were the ones that could move around players and throw a bunch of different sets. So I think you you can see T in some games playing a lot of small ball with the Wolves, and they throw us in small lineups, and T will have a really good week. And then maybe another week, guys like Andrew Wiggins, they play a little bit bigger, and Wiggins is taking more shots. And he has a really big week. I think last year you saw Wiggins, his offensive production kind of month by month up and down a little bit. When Wiggins is hitting a low week or month, then you have T taking more shots. So he's able to compensate for that as opposed to guys trying to fight for more shots or fight for more possession. You're kind of balancing out each other's highs and lows. And then you have guys like Jimmy Butler, Carl Anthony Towns, who are your steady guys who are producing night in and night out for you. Teague is a guy that some people think is going to be able to um, do similar things to what he did in Indiana. I completely don't agree with that. He's being drafted inside the top 50 in fantasy leagues, and I wouldn't be doing that just because, again, he's going to take fewer shots. He's going to have to be reduced to that fourth offensive option. But people can also look at it and say, well, he averaged 7.9 uh, assists last season, and my uh, my counter to that is yeah, that's great. But when he played for Atlanta the year before that, he averaged 5.9 assists per game so so which one is the real Jeff Teague and the thing is that we saw with Tom Thibodeau last year in this offense that for the first three months of the year until Zach Levine went down that we they were not utilizing Ricky Rubio as the main ball handler like it was Rubio would come up he would give it to Wiggins he would give it to Levine and he'd go and stand in the corner and now that he's got someone who's a better ball handler than both Wiggins and Levine a better pass a better decision maker a better player in Jimmy Butler, I think Butler's going to be running things and he's going to be racking up the assists. It's not going to be eight assists to Teague and three to Butler. It's going to be five versus six and Butler's going to be initiating a lot of this offense because we've seen Thibodeau do it. We've seen him coach Butler before and we've seen Butler do it before with Tom and and without. And I think that that's going to be the case and we're going to see Butler running a lot of things. And while he might not be a 25 point per game scorer, he's got a, a legitimate chance, I believe, to be a six assist guy here, Jimmy Butler. So do you see Thibodeau running things that way with Butler, much to the way that he ran things early on with Wiggins and Levine last season? Yeah, I think you're right. I think Teague does take a hit just because Butler is going to be the number one guy there. And as far as if you're drafting for uh, a team, I would definitely try and get your hands on uh, Jimmy Butler or Carl Anthony Towns if you're looking at the Wolves versus a Teague or Andrew Wiggins. And when we're looking at production, it's definitely those two guys who are going to rack up the most in generally everything. I think Jim Butler is going to be running a lot of the offense as well as taking plenty of shots. I think Carl Anthony Towns is the guy who's, he's the one who's not going to have his offense suffer. They're going to try and feed him the ball a lot, especially in the post. And he's going to get plenty of rebounds. He's going to be one of the bigger guys that they have always out on the court. So Teague is, I think you're right. He's going to, average somewhere in that five to six assists a game range just because when he's on the floor I think you're looking for him to be more of a catch and shoot guy as opposed to a distributor yeah that's that's totally how I see Teague this year so I'm not looking at him going oh he's getting the seven plus that he got in Indiana it is a completely different situation for him the, the other main piece that they brought across is Taj Gibson, and people are, are very infatuated with, oh, Taj is reuniting with Thibodeau. He's going to start over Gorgie Jang. He's going to play 30 minutes a night. I don't believe that for a second. He didn't start under Thibodeau in Chicago. We must remember that. He closed games, but he didn't start. He wasn't playing 32 minutes a night then. He's 32 years old. He wasn't great last year. So to me, he comes in, and he is the backup four he is the backup five which gives him over 20 minutes a night but I don't think and Gorgie Jeng played 34 minutes a night for Thibodeau last season and while I think Jeng's minutes are going to come down I don't think that Gibson is coming in and starting or playing 30 minutes a night this season do you see that another way or do you think that Gibson is just coming in as that backup four five player no Taj Gibson comes in and he plays the role I think Lance Stevenson did when he was briefly on the Timberwolves where you see him as that guy who comes in 16 to 25 minutes in a game and 
kind of helps the second unit keep a defensive edge. He's the guy who comes in and bangs around in the paint, grabs a few rebounds, and maybe starts pushing around guys on the other team. What he does for the team is more of a leadership and almost as a second coach out there on the court to help guys like Carl Anthony Towns really develop his defense and really develop as a, a really elite rebounder as opposed to a guy who's really going to help out your fantasy team. Yeah, look, he's getting drafted at 116 in Yahoo, which is bananas. There is no way that you want Taj Gibson there. 140 on ESPN, which is like their default position for anyone drafted yeah, later than that, which is fine. You don't draft Taj Gibson. I just don't see it. He's not coming in. He's not supplanting Towns. Clearly, he's not supplanting Jeng. He's playing that backup role, and he should be able to... Yeah, you know, he's replacing... I guess Cole Aldridge and Jordan Hill and a little bit of Nimanya Bielitsa from last season. And he will take some minutes off Jeng, I, I believe, but he's not playing these. People have this romanticized version of Gibson playing under Tom Thibodeau that he was a starter and playing 35 a night as a starting power forward. And he was none of those things. He was the sixth man. Um, he was the first big off the bench. He would close games. He would do defensive stuff. Um, and that's what he is, and that's what he is going to be here in Minnesota. The other player who is going to be a considerable part of the rotation that was brought in Colton was Jamal Crawford who was traded to Atlanta as part of the uh, Danilo Gallinari deal and uh, then was waived there and signed by the Timberwolves people still under the impression that Crawford is good he's not good he's to me is an average player he's definitely not a player that should be picked to pick 102 on ESPN in fantasy that is bananas to me but with the lack of depth that this team does have on the wing Crawford is going to have to play a significant role in this team. Now, we know that Thibodeau is going to run Butler and Wiggins out there for 50 minutes in a 48-minute game if he could. So Crawford is going to have his opportunities limited there, but there's no one else to really fill that role, is there? No, there's not. And I actually do like Crawford on this team, especially because with the Clippers, even in his last couple of seasons, he was averaging 12 points a game, and that's on a team with guys like J.J. Redick who are taking a lot of shots from outside. On the Timberwolves, they don't have a ton of real true perimeter shooters. And while I don't think he's going to be playing a huge amount of minutes in the the 20, 25 minutes that he's on the court, they're going to have him do a lot of the perimeter shooting for them. And so I think there's a real opportunity for him to, to put up a lot of a lot of shots and, and see a lot of open shots as well because I think that Jimmy Butler – guys like Teague, Wiggins, those kind of guys are really going to draw defenses and drive to the basket, be aggressive in the paint, and then they're going to try and sling it out to Crawford on the outside. So I I actually am a lot higher on Crawford than I am on Taj Gibson's value just because there's not really another guy to, that's younger that can take his role. So I think a bulk of the shots that he's going to be seeing are going to be open looks, and they're really not going to go to other guys. Yeah, that's true. There's no one else really apart from Teague. And even he is a bit of a streaky shooter that, that is a three-point shooter. And for the last three months of last season, Jamal Crawford shot 40% from three. But he has been inefficient recently. The last three seasons, his true shooting has been at 53% each of those three seasons, which is below league average. So he, he's not he's not a good fantasy option. We know that. He'll, he'll be a guy that you can stream in for three-pointers. He's not a guy that you want to draft. And for some reason, he's being drafted to pick 102 on ESPN, which I have absolutely no idea why you would want him anywhere near that position. 139 on Yahoo is still way too high, but he's going to be that guy who, who takes a lot of threes, as you said. Hopefully, he hits them. The attention is drawn to other areas, and you can do that relatively efficiently. Um, but it's just going to mean he's a streaming option for three-pointers, and, and that's that's really it for Jamal, and he's not going to be you know, doing too much of that. He's been an, an overrated fantasy guy for, for multiple seasons now, and that's going to continue to happen. He's finished outside the top 150 in both of the last two seasons, and uh, I don't think anything is changing with that this year. The other guys they brought in, Mello Trimble and Marcus George Hunt, to provide some backcourt depth, but they're just not going to play very much. And now uh, Anthony Brown on a two-way deal. Is there anything that you like about George Hunt or Trimble at all? I was a huge Melo Trimble guy in when he was at Maryland, but he he needs some work. He's one of those guys where the Timberwolves are probably taking him to stash on the roster for a couple of years and see if they can come back to him in two years and he's developed as his entire game. He has some really nice moves on the offensive side, a nice drive. He's got a little bit of a, a shake to him that he can get away from defenders and create a little bit of a shot, but he, he rushes into situations and this might've been a little bit of a product of there just wasn't a ton of talent around him on Maryland, but he does rush into situations and get himself into spots where he's making it easy for the defense 
to grab a turnover front from him. And so when you're playing on a team with all of these guys like Butler, T, Wiggins, Towns, there's really no excuse for a guy to rush into three defenders and then be stuck with the basketball in a bad spot. And so I don't think they're going to put him in situations where he's going to fail. I don't think you see him a ton uh, for both those guys. I don't think you see a ton of time from them. So I would stay away from them this year and maybe look for them, maybe not even next year, but the year after, maybe start looking for them to grab 16 to 20 minutes. Uh, And really, if you're drafting Timberwolves players, if you're drafting guys outside of Butler, Towns, and probably you could draft Wiggins fairly high, but after that, if you're drafting them pretty high, then you're overpaying for them just because a lot of the offense is going to go through those big three and they're going to look for those guys to produce the bulk of their offense. And, and they're going to want to keep this thing low scoring. This team has been built to get better defensively, not offensively. The guys that the Wolves have lost, Zach Levine and Chrissy Dunn, have both gone to the Bulls, Rick Rubio to the Jazz, Omri Caspri to the Warriors, and Adrian Payne to the Magic. And we've got currently Shabazz Muhammad, who is unsigned. There's talk that maybe he comes back to Minnesota. There's talk that the Lakers are interested, but at the moment he is unsigned. Brandon Rush and Jordan Hill are also unsigned. So it's been a significant turnover on this roster. Now, with that pick that they did get back from the Chicago Bulls, pick 16, Tom Thibodeau drafted Justin Patton. I don't think that that pick has been uh, praised universally. Uh, He's been criticized for that selection. Patton also has a fractured foot. Initially, I thought we weren't going to see Patton really at all this year, but uh, Thibodeau has come out now and said that he... Yeah, he's a good chance to be ready for the start of the season. I'm not 100% buying that, but even if he does, I don't see a considerable role for Justin Patton this season and with um, you know, one of the best players in the NBA uh, ahead of him in the, on the depth chart, his uh, his future role and his future value in dynasty leagues is pretty limited. But what's your latest take on the, uh, the injury to Patton and how much we see him this year? Well... As far as the injury, he did injure his foot pretty severely uh, and needed to have some work done on it. So just as far as a big guy who's probably going to be in the paint a lot, that one does concern me a little bit just because there's going to be plenty of times where he's jumping around, people are landing on his feet, he's landing on other people's feet. So that one concerns me a little bit, I hope, and I really think they're going to keep him out as long as possible just so he's fully healthy from that injury before because there's no need to to rush him back. So they want to make sure he's fully healthy from that foot injury. As far as his role, I think he's a really interesting prospect because I I don't think he plays center, but as a power forward, he's got a lot of speed. He's really good around the basket, and he has a really nice shot from that 15 to 20-foot range. I think he can create his own shot. I think in college you saw a lot of his speed just blowing past guys who – suspected him to be a lot slower because of his size and then he used that size on the defensive side of basketball to really work the boards and play over a lot of guys and get past people with that speed and size so I like him as maybe he slides over to that power forward spot and maybe at the end of this season next year you see him stealing minutes from Gorgie and maybe maybe supplanting Taj Gibson on the bench as somebody they want to work into rotation, but it really is in flux this year because of that injury. Uh, interesting. You say you're a little bit higher on Patton than, than what I am. Um, he did struggle with his free throws in college, only 51% shooter there, but he did he did show the ability to hit some jumpers, so that does give you hope that maybe that free throw percentage can come up, but he's going to be a guy that just doesn't have any impact really this season. The, the Wolves are also dealing with another guy with a broken foot, and that's Nemanja Bielitsa, who was out for the second half of last season with that foot injury. Um at this point, it doesn't appear like he is going to be ready for opening night, but it also doesn't appear like he is going to miss a huge amount of time. What's your most recent timetable on the foot injury for Bielitsa, and um, where does he fit into this rotation? Because he provides a stretch four that uh, Gorgie Jang and Taj Gibson uh, are neither, neither of, or neither of them are those uh, that thing. Well, first of all, the timetable come back. Uh, it does. They do look optimistic that he shouldn't miss a ton of time, but really, it just depends on his feel. So he really has to work with the trainers, and hopefully, he's only out for the first couple of weeks. But those foot injuries can be funny things in the way that you can feel fine, and then you get out on the court and you're running and stopping really fast, and change direction quickly, and then it can feel funny right away again. So. You just got to play those by ear. So 
hopefully he can be back within the first couple weeks of the season. But it really just depends on how he's doing personally and his, how his rehab coming back is doing. As far as where he fits in, I think he could be a nice little piece of that second unit to be that stretch guy, like you're saying, to add a little bit of depth. Because really this this roster has about 10 guys. I'd agree with your statement at the beginning of the show, about 10 guys that they have that are NBA players. But then beyond that, they don't have a ton of depth. So any guy that they can have that is going to grab minutes with that second unit and contribute, I think is a value piece. Maybe not a huge piece to draft, but he's one of those guys that saves that that new in your league for a week just because they took him a buck waiver wire and he got hot for a little bit and he was playing 25 minutes for a stretch. Yeah, look, and he's done that through his first two seasons, has these little runs where you go, shit, Pierlitz is hitting 55% of his shots for this week. He's getting one and a half threes. Exactly. He's doing this stuff. And you go, okay, that's cool. And then when the drop-off comes, you know that it's probably going to last for the next two months because that's sort of what he's done throughout his career. And again, with a foot injury, with the Gibson, Jeng, Towns all in front of him, his role is he's going to get minutes because, again, they don't have rotation players on this team. But he's not going to get enough minutes to be impactful in anything outside of you know 20-team leagues probably, which... Um, you know, to be drafted and then he'll have those boosts when he gets that extra playing time when uh, when Gibson you know, goes down or has to miss any time then he steps up and you know, his value does increase in that type of situation but he's not going to be he's not a great fantasy guy in, in the first place and uh, with the current situation the Wolves are in I don't really see him being a, being a great option now we talked about Gibson already and Gorgi Jang you know, he, was, he has to be mentioned when we talk about Gibson he played 34 minutes a night, but there were times when he would see you know, frustratingly low minutes. He'd play maybe 29 a night and, and Bielitsa would come in or or um, Thibodeau would do some different things at that power forward spot. Is there any way in your mind that Jeng plays the 34 minutes a night he played last year? Because I have got him significantly less than that this year. But I could also see a situation where he plays that same amount and becomes a, a real fantasy sleeper at the picks where he's going at pick 82 on uh, Yahoo. It is 61 on ESPN, which is way too high. But he could be a top 50 guy if he got those 35 minutes a night with his ability to get steals, get blocks, and be a very strong rebounder. I just don't see the minutes being the same as last year. If he comes out right away in the first month and shows that defensive edge that you're talking about, I think he does work his way back to 34 minutes a night just because Towns is still developing as a defender. And so they need the defense down low that he can provide but the other thing the other side of this too is that with Teague and Crawford out there if they're playing a team like the Warriors or even the Suns a team that wants to go smaller you could there's a lot of lineups or a lot of times I think you're going to see lineups where it's Butler, Teague, Wiggins, uh, Crawford just really small lineups and the times like that are going to kill his minutes overall just because he's not one of those guys that can really help their transition game, especially their transition offense. But at the same time, his defensive upside is something that I think Tom Thibodeau is really going to love. So it really depends on that first week. I know that's not a great answer for people drafting right now. I I would bet because Towns his defense has not developed all the way to where we want to see it yet, that he could still pick up those minutes just because he's a great defender, but watch the matchups carefully because if there's a if there's a stretch where they're playing the Suns, the Rockets, the Kings, and they really need a lot of transition offense and they're really looking to go small against those kind of teams, I would bet him just because I feel like they're going to play around with the Lions and throw a lot of Lions where they have Jamal Crawford and T out there at the same time with Wiggins and with Butler and really go small and really go fast. Jeng is a weird one to me because, again, he, he at pick 82, that could be too high on Yahoo or it could be significantly too low because if he is playing 35 a night, his defensive potential and, and what he does, rebounding steals blocks and really, really fantastic percentages, field goal and free throw percentage, it puts him in top 50 discussion. So he is a weird one and I would have no problem taking a flyer on him in that 90 to 100 range and, and seeing what happens. And if he does get back and, and Thibodeau trusts him the same, which, again, is, is part of the reason why I'm... Yeah, guess being negative at people who are saying that Taj Gibson's going to play these minutes. Yeah, Thibodeau likes what Jeng does. Like he liked what Jeng did last season. He was happy with what he did defensively and covering for Towns' defensive issues. So he did he did really like what, what he could do. So it's not like he, he hates Jeng and he needs to get him out of the lineup, but there is that risk that the minutes do drop and it is something that we do that we do need to watch uh watch this season. Um 
the backup small forward position is currently manned by, I've got no idea at, at this point. I guess it will be Wiggins and Butler that play there as they move Crawford in at the two. But apart from those guys, would be elite to play anything at small forward, do you think? Maybe a little bit, but I think you're right. I think they would mess around and put Wiggins and Butler back and forth in that spot. I would just bank on them taking the bulk of the minutes there as far as small forward. And I think for Butler... I think you see him take actually a considerable amount of minutes there and just have him play that kind of small forward spot, but he's still running the offense through him just so then they can put Teague and Wiggins out there as well and have their backcourt of Teague and Wiggins because I think with the way Teague plays defense, he's not an elite defender, but he still gets after the basketball and still can create turnovers, and ho- they're hoping that Wiggins turns into an elite defender with his length and speed, and so – if you have a really good defensive backcourt, there's really no reason to mess around with it and put Butler there. I think they just stick him at small forward. And he, with he, him at small forward, he's going to eat up all the minutes there. Let's uh, use this to transition to talk about Andrew Wiggins because he is currently being drafted inside the top 50 on both ESPN and Yahoo, and that would require him to take a significant leap from what he's done in the first three years of his career. I don't think it's going to be easy for him. I think it's going to be almost impossible for him to really take a big leap forward in scoring, and that's been his one valuable fantasy asset. He has pretty much sucked at all the other areas. Rebounding has been below average. Yeah, assists are not non-existent. Doesn't block shots. Steals haven't been high. Efficiency numbers are below average in both field goal percentage and free throw percentage. So for him, uh, Colton, to achieve anywhere near that ADP of 50 he needs to improve in an area that isn't scoring. What what could it be, and can he do it in this situation where, I guess, the perimeter defense is going to be a little bit more focused on Butler this season? Is, he, is it his efficiency that goes up? Does he move the ball more? Does he become more aggressive defensively and rebounding? Like What, what changes for Wiggins to enable him to take that step forward that we've been waiting for? I think Wiggins in every sense of the word is the second guy on a team. I think he's the second really good guy or the, even the third guy because Towns is probably going to move into that second role. And because of that, he's going to be on the second best offensive player on the other team. And I think his defense is going to be exponentially better because of that. I don't think he was really made to be guarding the, the Stephen Curry's of the NBA, but I really like him against the Clay Thompson of the NBA. I really think that he will develop as a defender. I think he's going to reach that next level as a defender because he's not asked to do everything in the basketball game on defense. That's Butler's role now. And with that weight off his shoulders, I think that he's just going to play a lot more loose basketball, a lot more instinctual basketball. He's not going to really worry about second-guessing himself. He's just going to get to his man, and he's going to stick to him. He's a fast guy. He's got great length. And I think when he's guarding the second best guy and not worried about doing all the little things defensively, he's just going to do them because it's going to be his instinct. He was a really good defender in college. And I, it, all the potential and raw talent is there. And now he doesn't have to worry about being the best defender on his team because that's Butler's role. And he's got a great defensive coach. Butler's going to be coaching him up already throughout the off season, throughout the preseason. He's going to be coaching him up. And you've got guys, too, like Taj Gibson who can help him with his rebounding, who can just show him little things and guide him to be a better rebounder. So I think as a defensive piece, he's going to be a lot better. And I think little things, too, I think he could probably get grab a couple more rebounds throughout a game. I think his coaching that he's going to get this offseason is what's going to be the difference for Wiggins. So I've talked about this with Devin Booker uh, on, the, on the Suns podcast. Um, Wiggins' ability to be a 20-point scorer means that his value in fantasy is elevated. I don't think that he's a top 50 guy, but when you look at his overall rank, um, he shouldn't be the, the 80th or 90th guy because getting 20 points per game is impossible at that point. So you know, taking Wiggins at pick 70 and hoping that his rebounds increase, his steals increase, his efficiency increases, which could, could all happen, is the better option because getting those 20 points is going to be tough. But I also thought he was the 82nd ranked player last season. So people drafting him are expecting a 30 plus point uh, or rank jump. And that's with the addition of Butler. So they're expecting something to change. I don't buy that. I wouldn't be picking him there at pick 50. But 
I would be very happy going 10, 12, 15 spots higher than what his you know, alleged rank is in order to get those those points and with that little bit of upside as he heads into his fourth season, which we know is uh, is a time when your know, third and fourth seasons of players take significant leaps forward in a lot of their per 100 or per 36 minute stats. A lot of those numbers and efficiency numbers do take a significant leap in the third and, uh, and fourth season. Now, Colton, last year I was pretty adamant not sure if you agree with me, I'm pretty sure you will, that Tyus Jones was significantly better than Chris Dunn, but Tom Thibodeau refused to play him as the backup for the majority of the time, and Dunn got those minutes. Now, Dunn is gone, so Jones moves into that backup point guard spot, and I thought the flashes that he showed last season should say that if Teague has to go down at any point, that the Wolves should feel, I guess, relatively comfortable that Jones would step in and be able to do will be able to hang with guys and be able to hit some shots and be able to, to move the ball around at a uh, probably a, an adequate to above adequate level. Yeah, I I love Ty Jones and I think the number one thing I really like about his game is that he is a instinctual passer. I think Chris Dunn second guessed himself a ton when he was trying to pass the ball, trying to work the offense through him. Ty Jones isn't like that. He's a smooth offensive guy. He's going to find open guys and he's going to pass the ball right away to get the ball quickly to guys who can make shots and he's going to do a good job moving the ball not only in half court but in transition I think he's going to force defense to play a little bit on their heels and force the ball quickly down the court in transition and I think he's just a little bit safer with the basketball as well I think he's making good decisions with the ball and he's not going to create a lot of or offer up a lot of turnovers I should say for the defensive opposing teams. He's going to be smart with the basketball. And he's he's just got a knack for, for getting it to the right guy. He's not going to put the shooter in a bad spot where maybe the shooter has to create his own shot. He's going to get the ball to him, and he's going to give him a, a clean look at the basket when he's taking a shot. So I, I really like Tyus Jones, and I think it says something that Chris Dunn was the one traded and not Tyus Jones, even when – Dunn was the one getting the minutes. I think you saw him drafted higher, so he was given more opportunity. But when he didn't prove himself, Thibodeau said, I'm going with Tyus Jones, the guy who is showing production even in the few minutes that he's been on the court. And I think he's got potential. And I think that says a lot about Tyus Jones' upside. Yeah, look, I'm big on Jones. I've said for, for years that I thought he should get a bigger role and I would have loved to have, to have got traded to, say, the Sixers before they drafted Markel Fultz and let him try and yeah, run stuff on a developing team. And Teague is not a, an old player. He's not a young player, though. So yeah, maybe you could see in two, three years' time, Jones potentially pushing for that starting point guard job. He's got a good assist rate. He's got a good steal rate. Um, I think that his uh, efficiency will improve. I think he can score a bit. He is a guy that I do really like who is cheap in dynasty-type formats, and we're going to see him in an elevator role this season, which I'm pretty excited about. Now, the main guy on this team is obviously Carl Anthony Towns. He is a player that you could make an argument for to be the number one guy in fantasy. I've got him currently at number three, but if you took him at number one, it's totally acceptable. I, I understand that he's going to be a, probably a 26 and 13 type of guy. He can hits he hits his threes, but the real strength in Towns, apart from that rebounding and scoring, is his efficiency. And at the start of last season, people drafted him in the top 10, and they were disappointed Like because for the first two months, he was like the 20th ranked guy. And they're like, oh, what is going on with this guy? I drafted him at five. He's killing me. And that's be only because his field goal percentage was like at 48%. In the second half of the year, he was like 57 58% consistently, and that brought his value back up, and he finished as the seventh overall player. He is currently being drafted at seven on Yahoo and ESPN. I think that is way too low. There is no way I'd want him at seven. I think that yeah, he can take another step forward clearly into his third year. The efficiency sticks. But the one thing I do want to really focus on on, on Towns Colton is his shot blocking, which dropped off significantly last season, but we forget that he was an absolutely elite shot blocker at Kentucky. 4.3 blocks per 40 minutes he had in his one season there. He was at 1.7 in his rookie season, but dropped down to 1.1 last year. I think that's uh, in per 36 numbers. Let me just double check that. Um, no, in, that's in real life numbers. He went from 1.3 blocks down to 1. Point, uh, so 1.7 blocks in 32 minutes down to 1.3 in 37 and I posit the reasoning that Gorgi Jeng was playing defensive center majority of the time last season, so Carl was out uh, guarding power forwards. Now, if the Taj Gibson taking a few minutes off Gorgi Jeng scenario happens, as I think it will, that should push Towns closer to the basket and guarding more centers, which may 
then therefore increase his block rate. Do you think that that is the reason why his blocks have dropped so significantly and why he just hasn't been an impactful shot blocker like he was in Kentucky? And do you think that reasoning is is sound? I do. I also think that he had a little trouble making that switch. Like you were saying, he was blo- he was guarding more power forward. So I think he had a little more trouble making that defensive switch than before. If you're Tom Thibodeau, this is one of your blue chip guys. This is one of your franchise guys who is going to be great for probably, you're assuming the next eight to 10 years. Yeah, at least. So you want him to be able, you want him to be able to guard a couple positions just because he is really fast. He's and really big and you want him to be able to go from center to power forward to maybe even small forward to be able to guard them based on who's the better player, not based on what position he plays and what position they play. So I think you will see him bounce around guarding centers and power forwards this year. And I think they just want his defense to grow. And he is a really talented player. He's really, really good with tremendous upside. So I think you see his blocks go up, but I think that's just because he's become a better all-around player, not necessarily because he's guarding different guys or because other players are experiencing less minutes than last year. I think it's just because he's getting better in Every year, I think you're going to see jumps in his numbers just because I think really the sky's the limit for this guy. And this is really what they're building the franchise around. It's not a guy like Jimmy Butler. They're signing max extensions. They're extending guys because they want to keep Towns and keep him around for the long haul. The last half of last season, so the last 43 games is the split I've got here. He averaged 28 and 12.7. He hit 1.33s. He blocked 1.1 shots, but he shot 59% from the field and 85 from the line for a true shooting of 66%, which is just a crazy, crazy number. Um, I don't think that he's going to be averaging 28 per game this year. I think that he takes, even if it's just a shot less than what he took last year um, with Butler around half a shot less. And I also don't think he's going to be able to maintain 59% shooting throughout the course of the season. But he's got that number one upside. And if you took him at one, there is absolutely no issue with that. I don't think he should be escaping really the top three or four. And pick seven in uh, in average draft position is, is craziness to me. There is no way that I would let him fall that far. We've seen that potential for that last half of last season. 28 and 13 on 59 and 85 is, is out of control. It's fantastic. And then if the blocks come up, yeah, that's, that's something extra. Like a post-All-Star break, he averaged 0.8 blocks a game. And he was still the number three guy. So that's showing how valuable everything else does. And then if he adds the blocks back in, and imagine if he gets to two blocks a game, then you're talking about the unquestioned number one player in fantasy basketball. And I did say when he was drafted, I think he was going to be the number one guy probably by the end of his rookie contract. I think he's probably a little bit ahead of where I thought he would be, and that's you know, saying something considering how high a praise I had for him at the time, and he could very easily finish this season as the number one guy. So yeah, he shouldn't be escaping that top three or four in any sort of uh, in any sort of fantasy draft situation. And um, yeah, just don't worry too much about the Butler addition impacting him because his ability in the other areas, like those rebounding the, the, and the volume percentages is what really is what really brings the value for him. One guy we haven't touched on, I don't think there's a huge amount to touch on with him. He's a guy that I liked, but he was he was buried and he was bad last year, and that's Cole Aldrich. Um, he's just going to be in that similar situation again this year, isn't he? Absolutely, and I think there's actually a lot of potential that he can move as well. That's true. I think if you go through the first couple of months and they decide – you know what, we really do need a guy who is really, really good at shooting threes, or if somebody gets injured and they're going to be out for a couple months, then need a, to a band-aid for a few months to play a role after an injured guy comes back. I think you see him get packaged with the Utah pick that they got for Ricky Rubio, and he gets traded away. So not only do I think that he plays about as many minutes as last year, I think he only stays on the team for two or three months. Yeah, I can totally see him being. He's on a pretty decent contract. He was really productive with the Clippers, but just didn't see any playing time at all with Minnesota last year. Who's your breakout candidate on this team, Colton? I am going to beat the same drum I did earlier and say I think Wiggins takes a big step up. I think maybe he averages a couple less points just with Butler there, but I think you see those three guys, Butler, Towns, and Wiggins, 
do most of the offensive production for the Wolves. And I think on defense, I think he takes a step up. I really think that him being on the second best or third best guy really helps his defensive game develop. And I think that the pressure that Butler takes off his shoulders by just being the number one guy and taking the defensive responsibility upon himself, I think that really helps Wiggins. I think there were a lot of games where you saw Wiggins play really tight and he just he looked like he was a little off his game. I think he gets back to that loose just playing basketball and worrying about getting the shot and getting open and defending the guy as opposed to worrying about the overall production of the team. I think he's, his role is a lot better as the second guy as opposed to the number one guy. And so I think in the numbers, I think you see that play out, and I think he has a really – good season on defense and i think his offensive production stays consistent around that 20 point range yeah i can i I can totally see all this happening with wiggins we've been sort of let down by all the other areas of his game over his first three years scores really well but a lot of areas that improvement but all this stuff could could happen this year and i I totally understand that my breakout guy would be tyus jones just because i think people will start to realize that he's actually good and he's actually a a capable backup point guard when he'd been buried as the third guy and dnp cds all over the place now he steps into a role and i think he's going to get a chance to show maybe the more casual Timberwolves fan or the general NBA fan that this guy is a is a legitimately solid I, I put him in the Tyler Eulis category of really good backup point guards that can be a backup point guard at 20 minutes a night for 8 to 10 years and maybe he could step into a starting role that's sort of the level that I have him at I'm pretty excited to see what he does in a more full-time role now just to wrap this up, um, go through some value fantasy guys. I think the most valuable guy is Towns. At pick seven, if you're getting him there, that's that's huge value. I, I really obviously like him there. Jim Butler's a, a solid mid-second round guy. If you took him at the yeah, end of the first, start of the second, I don't think it would be bad because as we discussed, him getting those assists along with 20-point scoring and, and maybe two steals a game is super valuable. Jeff Teague and Wiggins, I think, are a little bit overrated in terms of them being top 50, or you have to pick them inside the top 50. That's not guys that I want at that spot. Teague, I think, is significantly overrated, and there are plenty of other point guards I want there. And and as I said with Wiggins, he needs to take multiple steps up in other categories to get there. And Gorgie Jeng's an interesting one. I don't really know where where he sits because he could be overrated, he could be underrated, but totally fine to be taking a, a flyer on that guy. And as I touched on earlier, Jamal Crawford and Taj Gibson, there is no way you want anything to do with those guys in any sort of standard fantasy league. So I don't know why they even have average draft positions, but but they do. And uh, that means you should avoid them. Colton, we'll finish this off by you getting some uh, predictions for the season. Vegas has this team's over-under at 48.5, while ESPN's Kevin Pelton has them projected at 50.1 wins, which is a significant increase from last season. Do you think they are beating that Vegas over-under of 48.5? I do. Uh, I think that they have a really, really good defense here. And for... The first month of the season, there's going to be plenty of people who panic when they don't beat every single team that they play. But you just got to let them gel. They really haven't had a ton of time together. They haven't had a, an actual game yet. Let's all remember that as well. So over the first month, there's a little bit of a gelling process. But I think this team really does a great job just because they were giving up so many points mm. last year, every single game, especially in that fourth quarter. And in that fourth quarter, a ton of times you saw Jimmy Butler really come alive on defensive and offensive side. So I think that defense really improves how they play throughout the course of the season. I also think it is just another year that Towns has had to get under his belt and Wiggins as well, both really young guys. You got to remember, Wiggins is just 22 year old going into this season. So these guys are really young on this team. So that extra year of experience is a big deal. They're going to have that extra year of experience and now they have Jimmy Butler on the team to help them on the defensive side. And this whole roster has been with them just that extra year, so now they can really start to implement his system, especially on the defensive side. And the way that he wants this team to look is going to be a lot closer to form than it was last season. So I think that 49 wins is definitely not out of the question. I see them hitting that 50-51 to 51 range as far as wins. I can totally see them getting to that. To me, it's a little bit of a stay away just because it is requiring such a significant leap forward that um, while I do think that 50 is a realistic target that I'm just not 
sure that you know jumping up that many wins from a, a team that was under 40 wins to be going going to 50 is a significant jump forward so it's a, a little bit of a stay away i'm not looking at over or under it's more just a, like i think i'll just leave that one leave that one alone now colton can you uh let us know what you might have coming up on locked on wolves or anything else that you've got uh, that you want to plug or, or let us know about uh your twitter handle any of that sort of stuff Absolutely. On Twitter, you can follow me at C.M. Molesky. You can follow me at C. Molesky. And I just had a pod on Locked on Wolves, the blue chip players. Carlin Day Towns is one of my guys just going through what a blue chip player is, who they are in the league, why I think those guys are the ones you can build your team around. We also will have a show coming out this weekend just on NBA News. Tom Schreier is back from his hiatus. So catch that show for sure at the end of the week we'll have one going up and then college football as well i do cover the gophers so college football specifically geared towards gophers but also just covering big 10 college football and college football all the happenings that go on throughout the week and we'll be covering that for you at some coverage all right, go and uh, go and follow Colton on Twitter and go and download and subscribe to Locked on Wolves. And if you could give that podcast and this podcast a five-star review, that would be fantastic on Apple Play, on uh, sorry, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and now the podcast is available on Spotify as well. If you give us reviews there, that would be absolutely awesome. And a quick reminder, Basketball Monster is now open for subscriptions, memberships for this season. So go ahead and get your membership, get out my, get my projections, uh, get our draft tracker, our trade analyzer, our team analysis, all that great stuff that you've come to know from Basketball Monster. And if you haven't used Basketball Monster before and you want to know some uh, some extra information, hit me up on Twitter at redrock underscore b-ball and we can, uh, I can discuss what the sort of stuff that you have uh, you, you, that you can uh, absorb through Basketball Monster. Colton, thank you for coming on and discussing the Minnesota Timberwolves with me. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Go Wolves. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jamal Crawford.